give anything. They just, they must have. That's their sound you hear. Just tell me, do you still run outside the house when there's a warning siren? People are supposed to hide inside, honey, not run outside. I said with resigned sarcasm, outside, inside, it hardly makes any difference. It doesn't matter. If anything happens to me, we say friendly fire, mistaken fire, negligent fire, and that's it. She screamed, I swear to God, if anything happened to you, I would pace in circles in the mountains. I laughed and said, forget about pacing in circles in the mountains. Pacing in circles in the house is enough. We ended the conversation with hide. Hide well from friendly fire, from negligent fire, from fire that doesn't miss its target. My mother doesn't know that if the warning siren goes off while I'm asleep, as it does every morning like clockwork, I stay asleep until the sound shatters the last image of my dream. I just mutter, damn you, with only the taste of bitterness on my lips. I stay asleep, not because I'm courageous or because I'm cowardly. I just surrender more to sleep, surrender more to dreaming and death at the same time. Getting out of bed has always seemed more catastrophic than dying in bed. So why should I get up? Where should I flee to? I don't know where the closest or farthest shelter is, the closest or farthest death. Sleep lets me forget that a siren over Tel Aviv means blood in Gaza. But a shelter here means rubble there, and that running away from the building here means survival, while every attempt to flee in Gaza, no matter where, means death. My mother also doesn't know that I tried running away once to the stairwell of the house with a cigarette, barefoot and with no lighter, at the same time that my Jewish neighbors arrived with their children, holding cell phones and cups of wine between their fingers cups that had been poured as though there were no war, as though there were no Gaza, and as though there were no death. They had poured them as though they had all the time in the world to pour blood and wine and chatter around it. They looked at me and I looked at them. We didn't say anything. There was nothing to be said. It was a time in which you couldn't say anything. It was a time that closed in on my neck and suffocated me in silence. One woman holding a drowsy child against her chest broke the silence. She looked at me and said, isn't our country crazy? I wanted to curse at her. I wanted to insult her, kick her, and drag her by her hair through the whole neighborhood like the women of Jaffa do. I said to myself, Enough already, I want to tell her to go to hell. Whose country, lady? But what happened is that I took a drag from my cigarette, a deep drag that I inhaled and exhaled, and I said in Hebrew, Nahan, that's right. But screw this time of day. I fell silent and she fell silent, and she and I each counted to ten, ten seconds until the last piece of shrapnel fell, before going back into the house. She went into her house and I went into my house, she with her daughter and I by myself, with neither one of us daring to unleash our bitter words on one another. After that day, I began, if the sorry went off while I was putting on my eyeliner, to hold fast to my eyeliner pencil, extend the eyeliner across my eyelid, and say that a woman beautifies herself under death, in death, and before blood. I began to fear forgetting that I'm here, that I haven't died, and that they haven't taken yet everything. If it, weren't, if it went off while I was smoking, I lit, an, I lit another cigarette with the light of the first and said, well, why doesn't Tel Aviv just burn up like Gaza is burning up? And take Jeff along with it. I wanted Tel Aviv to burn up and to become rubble, all the Tel Aviv with its restaurants, nightclubs, markets, and streets. And uh, I would love it if you would take over from here. I wanted rockets to shatter its wings and shells to come through its soul now and forever. I wanted its wings to scream and wail. Its elephants to 
Lincoln, bright skinned women preoccupied with shopping, staying up at night, and getting sunburnt by the sea. Let the sea die too. I wanted them to wail and to get up from underneath the rubble, or to not get up. It doesn't matter to me. I wanted blood on their elegant clothes and dust in their children's hair. I wanted the city's hospitals to fill up with the injured, the killed, and their corpses. I wanted rubble, tears, and blood, and blood, and blood. I wanted blood in exchange for blood. I wanted a little bit of death here in Tel Aviv. I wanted more than that. The city of specters by night and day, whose residents come out to buy bread or water and don't know whether or how they'll return. I wanted them to be preoccupied with death here, counting corpses and digging graves of all sizes. Then I wanted other things of the same color, unending bread. This time, I feared not them, but myself. I feared that I am my killer, that I am my enemy, or that I am the gunfire that doesn't miss me. This is what this place does to me. I am neither dead nor alive. It's a long limbo with no angels torturing me while I await the possibility of being rescued. It's a limbo in which life tortures me without the possibility of being rescued. It's a life in which neither death nor life triumphs, in which, and in which life negotiates over death and over life. Next, I begin to curse the sky, and the siren went off, and point to their Lord, until there was nothing left for me to curse, and there was no one left that I had not pointed to, saying, let him die. I began to say when it ended, damn you, I curse the sky that you mount on us, that you come from, that is pregnant by you and that obeys you, that is yours. You do not like life in us and choose the direction of death for us. Where do we go when you are everywhere? Where do we go when you are the place and its Lord? Where do we go when you are many like God? Where will we flee from this demise of ours that you stick by force into our mouths? Where will we go from the death that you have transformed into the bread of the world that you have accustomed us to? and that we have begun to eat. We have begun to know. It has begun to know us, and we have begun to like it. What direction befits our demise? The direction that doesn't lead to you. The direction that doesn't lead to us. The direction that we won't mention while you are lying with your women, eating your food, and hugging your children. The direction of the sea, because it's easier to get rid of our trace. The land, there is no land off of Gaza. The borders in Gaza are clear, from the sea, you, from the dry land, you, and from the sky, you, and where God and death both. As the war went on for two weeks, three weeks, forty days, fifty days, I sat and did nothing except stare into the blankness, the blankness of the computer screen upon which the black cursor was pulsating, waiting for my fingers to command it with a letter, a word of inner feeling. From the adjacent room throughout the day, I could hear the stripes of my co-worker my last fingers in the computer or screen, violently and with total abandon. I resented her because she was writing, because speech obeyed her, came to her, and became under her fingers. A being that spoke to her and that she spoke to, and maybe that she caressed and that caressed her, then licked her fingers. In the room adjacent to her room, I sat staring into the blankness. I stared and I stared. And the blankness swallowed me, the blankness that was deep, vast, bottomless, and the black cursor on the computer screen pulsated. For the first time, I noticed that the black cursor on the computer screen pulsated. It pulsated and pulsated, raising my ire. I hated that black cursor that day. I hated it when it puts its hand on its hip like a dark-complexioned, ratty girl, and its patient ran out, as it were saying, just try and make me stop and pulsating and you don't have any say in it. Speech has finished with you like someone that water has finished with. You will make me wait when all of you, when all you control is blankness. All that I could think about was that I hadn't used since the war, or rather since before the war. No, since the beginning of the winter. No, since the beginning of spring. The word pulsing. Let me repeat it. Everything around me is dead, is dying, will die or is waiting to die. Dead while it hides in shelters. Dead while it runs to the shelter. Dead if it reaches it and dead if it doesn't. If it is late or if it isn't. Dead if it comes out and dead if it doesn't. Dead if it comes back. Dead if it thinks about coming back. Dead if it waits for dead. And if its death doesn't come, 
dead bullets alone. I will repeat it aloud with my hands on my lips, my neck and my shoulders, and the hip of the sky. Pulsate, 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 until my lips get used to it, my body knows it, my body before the war. This is a word that I reared on my fingers and that I fed well from, my lips, my neck and my shoulders. This is the word of the night when it is getting late. The war has made me forget a lot of speech. I love you, I've missed you, you consume me, I breathe you and I want you, lip, bite. The war has made me forget so that you no longer keep me waiting. Get out and take your coat with you. Go to hell when you bite when your bite is farther than from my moan. Then when the siren went off, I began to forget the way that I spoke before the war. I began to take on another, very different way of speaking that I substituted for all the synonyms of all kinds of death. At first, I was naive, like in every war. I thought that death, death takes its names from the mouths of broadcast correspondents, political analysts, military spokesmen, and from the videos that the is al-Din al-Qassam brigades film, a rocket, a salvo, a sniper, and bullets. Bullets that the sky pours, your sky. You are their lord in life and our lord in death. How do I hide my blood from you? You are their lord. There is a bullet stuck in my throat, but I am not a rifle. I said to you first, stop their bombing. Crash what you call the Akshab Mountains down on them. Then I understood that you don't want to. You haven't stopped them since, you cro since they crossed the sea to your promised land. They denied you, they worshiped the golden calf, they killed you, and you kept silent. Then I said to you, no, let them kill, bomb and burn, but I am rallying all the dead now. But in this war, death had other names beside Dear al Balah al Ramal and Beit Hanun. There are others. Girl and boy. Girl and boy, house, bird, wind, and tree, and flight. Suddenly, death had an address, a mailbox, a threshold, a porch, a window, a bed, and a pillow and a bowl in every house. It began to know the neighbors, the neighborhood shops, the bedtimes, the times of inattentiveness, and which dream to break to close in on you. It began to borrow young girls' dresses and men's shirts and rummage with its fingers through the dresses of adolescent girls. It began to leave its scent on them without shame so that we would know that it had come, that it has been here. Then it began to come not by itself, but with its troops and its equipment. It became capable of being exactly your personal fit. It began to come knowingly, not randomly, for there is no random death in Gaza. It began to know the size of your chest, your waist, your thighs, your forehead, your neck, it began to come knowingly wherever it was planted, wherever it kills you, in any direction. Any expression ending in you will be fatal. It knows how you haven't been healed from it, how you haven't been rescued from it, how you will finish with it, and how it won't finish with anyone but you. Finally, I began to play fast and loose with speech when the siren went off to get speech to come, because my window in the sky of Papa overlooking Tel Aviv, which stole from Jaffa its sky and its oranges, and gave it communion wafer of hashish and an unlicensed revolver doesn't help matters. No, and cigarettes are of no use, nor are dozens of cups of coffee one after another, and making speech less desiccated on my fingers. How can I write death? How can I write about your death that you send us from your sky, from the covenant of heaven that you bestowed upon Shahiyah, Baikanan, Kanyunis, Aurumal, Darabala, and the blood is long. Thank you. Um, okay. This is a little different than uh, what you might read in the newspaper. It even reads a little bit like fiction. It's very creative in its record. So I wonder if should we talk about this in terms of, of what it's trying to do and what it accomplishes and how it does it in the context of creating a different narrative. Maybe the, you know, the way to start is to say, first of all, what is the point of view? 
Who's writing this? So the point of view is a witness, and this is a particular witness, this is a Palestinian woman in Tel Aviv. So, and by the way, there are plenty of pieces in this that give you the point of view of Israelis. So it's a balanced kind of point of view, certainly. Okay, so we've got a, a Palestinian woman, and she is um, she's giving us first a, uh, a view uh, of what's happening. We've got something happening. It's the first. It's the siren that gets you out of bed. Her mother so distraught. You must hide. You must be safe. And then 